Matthew, you, you came up with a very interesting set of concepts about uh, the venture community in large energy projects today. Yesterday at a venture panel, um, Joel with Kleiner Perkins and a couple other people were debating about whether there were too many lemmings entering into uh, energy, uh, renewable energy investment now. You took a more nuanced approach, uh, talking about COSLA uh, as a clear cutter and others, Four Winds as kind of specialists. Tell me a little bit about what you think are going to be the successful models for venture firms uh, in the next decade. I think it's tough. Um, you know, there's this old machine of angel funding followed by venture financing in some cases with an injection of growth equity or private equity then leading to public markets that works really well for IT because as a rule, although there are exceptions in semiconductors and telecom equipment, uh, you don't need a tremendous amount of money. They're pretty capital efficient investments uh, and works for life sciences because there's a rule book, a uh, rule book that you can follow by using the FDA and EMEA approval cycles as a way of determining how far on a company is. None of those rules exist in the materials, energy, and environment world, and you need more money over longer periods of time, which frequently break 10-year closed-ended fund cycles that venture capitalists, as a rule, have, although there are, again, some exceptions, uh, with greater levels of technology risk further down the cycle, down into the land that you have tens of millions of dollars investments being made by private equity and growth equity funds. And I think the machine just doesn't work. We need a new machine. Uh, in terms of how that's going to be pulled off, there are some innovations that look promising, but I don't think you know what works until folks have seen a 25% IRR on doing it in a new way. Uh, I think it's really interesting to see somebody like uh, Great Point Ventures, for example, that has a small amount of money from Kleiner Perkins and from uh, Applied Technology Ventures, uh, Advanced Technology Ventures, pardon me, to be able to go out and seed companies, get them to a point that they're ready for a venture fund so you can cut off that first part of the technology development cycle and get it to fit into a 10-year closed-ended structure. Maybe that'll work. I think it's interesting to see uh, project financiers beginning to construct joint venture vehicles, uh, particularly for water and for waste technologies or the process technologies, where there may be a carve-out slice of equity for the venture financier that may get them some return, some meat they can bring home to the cave for their LPs before the company is able to achieve a liquidity event. But ultimately, I think uh, this is a time of great experimentation and visible discomfort, and it's probably going to be a good five or ten years before we know which, if any of these ingredients are going to work out. I wouldn't try to be so prescient. Uh, as to call it at this point. I don't think it's something you can call based on fundamentals. Your chart showed uh, what might have been a totally uh, new but permanent entrant between the VC and the IPO in the sense of bringing in the growth equity partner. Mm -hmm. And uh, just past the downturn of 2001, there was this belief that uh, growth equity or just traditional private equity would play this magical permanent role. And yet now, we see some uncertainty about that and more of a feeling like venture funds themselves should start these longer term, bigger money roles. Do you think uh, growth equity is going to be permanent in there or was this kind of a transitory thing? I think growth equity is coming back. Uh, you know, our business is, is looking at technologies and markets, less so finance, but we do run into a lot of it. And I would say what we see from our seat and looking at the technologies with the financing attached to them. Uh, there are a lot of folks who abandoned mezzanine stage financing, what happens before an IPO, after the internet bust, but there were a few that stuck with it. One, for example, is a firm called Advanced Equities, the West Coast, that has relationships with KP and Sequoia and a bunch of others, that actually is itself about to go public uh, as a sort of new breed of investment bank uh, that makes technology ventures happen because they stuck with it when no one else did. And at the same time, there are these somewhat neglected assets, uh, which are the growth equity arms. They're usually separate operating entities. Uh, firms like Northbridge, uh, where the Venture Partners Group there has a Northbridge Growth uh, Equity Unit and Granite Global, which is attached to Venrock, that have spent recent years doing a lot of money putting into businesses that may not even be very technology-based in emerging markets in places like China and India, and may now actually have a big opportunity to deploy larger chunks of capital with a right of first refusal uh, to investments that come out of their VC partners. So I think those are probably diamonds in the rough. There may be more that can be made of them than has been in the last four or five years. You talked about the smart venture firms being the ones who talk to the customers of potential startups to say what problems do you need solved five years down the line, and then they create a company out of those uh, inquiries. And I thought about that when thinking about your example of Bob Metcalf and the algae company that uh, before they knew it, they were going to be looking at the conveyor belt issues because right. the algae were too prolific. Uh, do you think that we are going to see more 
instances in clean tech and energy of business plans that get ripped apart and changed five times over before the company ultimately decides what it is it's supposed to be doing? Yeah, I think that happens in every field of, uh, of high technology startups. I'm not sure there are many software startup companies running around that haven't gone after business model A, B, C, and D uh, before they finally result in, in the thing that's able to allow them to get to a liquidity event. I think the difference from an energy environment perspective uh, is that the problems are just less well-defined. I think with somebody with a startup, software startup sits down, there may be an explicit problem that they're trying to solve up front. Maybe that problem mm -hmm. changes, but it's well-defined from the first instantiation to the fourth or fifth. Whereas from the energy perspective, Green Fuel makes another good example, the algae company. It actually turns out that you can get a lot more revenue from the same unit of algae, not by fermenting it to make biofuels, but by selling it as fish feed. Uh, or as an additive, the desiccated algae itself are more valuable than the biofuels you can make from them, at least at current stage. Maybe that changes over time, and certainly that market has a cap to it, but you probably produce a lot of algae before you exhaust it. Uh, so it's that lack of definition, just because people haven't really done a lot of this beforehand. There haven't been a lot of venture-backed, entrepreneur-led, proprietary intellectual property-based uh, materials and energy environment companies. That's a, a phenomenon of the last decade or two, although there's certainly some exceptions in mass. I think that holds and uh, it's an adventure. We'll see where it takes us. <laughs> now, you had listed several very intelligent uh, rules uh, for getting out of the broken venture capital uh, model. And I'm wondering if Lux Research has had an opportunity to talk to many investment companies about thinking how they should change their investment models and whether they're receptive to those kind of messages out there. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of a nuance in it in that the, I wouldn't say the rules for investing. We wouldn't go so far as to tell people we're going to give them some advice on how to structure their fund. In terms, though, of asking the right questions from a diligence perspective, I, I, I think they are pretty meaningful. Uh, you know, again, whether it's expecting exponential growth curves to go on for significantly longer than they normally do, uh, or not recognizing that the cast of characters changes a lot in an area like solar where people are pretty comfortable with technology categories that are probably just going to be blown to bits in the next five years by novel technologies, solid state technologies, uh, uh, heat to electricity technologies that just operate in a slightly different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, that, that, that is a pretty big deal. And I think some of this is going to correct itself over time just with more experience, with more companies that have gone through the cycle with more folks like, you know, Maurice Gunderson at CMEA, who's already done this once before, and he did it in its power, and he's now doing it in another fund. Um, I think the danger zone exists where there are very large amounts of capital being deployed by people who are extremely smart and have a pattern recognition set that's been built from companies in IT and life sciences that just have a different context. Uh, and they're super smart people. They'll adapt really quickly, but quickly may not be fast enough to avoid losing your shirt a couple of times over. I think we've already seen that with a number of companies in energy and environment, particularly Me Too biofuels plays, and it's coming soon with Me Too solar plays. Uh, and I think that's going to be a fixture of the field for the foreseeable future. All right. Well, very good. Matthew, I appreciate the time today. This is Loring Werbel from uh, EE Times Market Intelligence Unit, uh, and uh, appreciate the Lux Research's work. Look at the world. Absolutely. Thank Thanks. you.